Okay, hello everyone. My name is Yvonne Lynch. I am the chair of the IAA's Professionalism Committee. You are very welcome to today's webinar on real life experiences of standard setting. I'm just pausing because I think a few other people are still dialing in. Well, I'm sure they'll catch up with us. A few housekeeping things before we uh, before we start. Uh, we're going to have two presentations today, and at the end of it, we're going to have a questions and answers session. So to uh, put your question, just click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and type it in. You can type it in anonymously, or you can add your name, whichever you wish. We're also very happy to hear any comments that you may have. And we'll try and deal with all your questions and comments during the Q&A session at the end. And if you hear something particularly interesting and you'd like to hear it again, there will be a recording of the presentation available through the IA website and on YouTube afterwards, along with a copy of the slides. So the agenda today, I'll give a brief introduction, and then we will be joined by Berger Kaiser and Lisa Wade, who you can see here on your screen, who will talk about standard setting experiences in Germany and the Caribbean, respectively. And I'll introduce Berger and Kaiser as we go through the session. So today is actually the second event in a series of virtual events that the IAA Professionalism Committee is currently organizing and delivering. So the first one took place on the 7th of September. We had a webinar on an introduction to standard setting. Hopefully some of you managed to come along to that as well. Just to recap very, very briefly. Um, so we talked about why to standard setting, why are standards important? We talked about how standards protect the public, they protect the users of actuary work and the people who are ultimately affected by that work. But they also support actuaries in their work by clarifying expectations on how um, actuary work will be performed and providing benchmarks for um, assessing good practice. We talked about how standards are developed. Uh, we, we, we looked at different approaches, a self-regulation approach, external regulation, mixed models. And then we looked at the various elements of a due process from deciding what standards you want to drafting them, consulting with stakeholders through to publishing them, educating our members on them and so forth. A key message out of all that was that there was there is no single correct way to develop and implement standards. So listen to what we have to say, but think about what would work well in your environment. And another key message is don't feel overwhelmed by it. Um, there's nothing wrong with starting small, building a foundation and then building on that, setting a foundation and then building on that over time. We also talked in the last webinar about International Standards of Actuary Practice or ISAPs, the model standards developed by the IA, and they're a really useful resource, particularly to those associations that are embarking on standard setting for the first time or in the early stages of their standard setting activities. And I'm sure they will be mentioned again as we go through today's session. Um, the, the recording of the webinar and the slides are available on the IA website. If you go to the committee's page and then the professionalism committee page and then onto documents, you'll find them there along with lots of other resources, or you can just click on the links on this slide here. Then, as I said, today's is the second uh, in, in the series. And then on the 25th of October, we're going to run a virtual workshop. And that is aimed particularly at those associations that have reached out to the professionalism committee or to the advice and assistance committee looking for help with standard setting, be that help with developing content or developing processes or both. So we have sent invitations to those associations. However, if your association would like to be involved, um, do contact Amali in the next few days because we're trying to finalize our, our arrangements for, for these workshops and uh, we will facilitate as many associations as we can. Um, we, it, this will be a very interactive session so that it will include discussions in small breakout groups and from that the professionalism committee wants to learn. We want to learn what are the issues facing associations as they embark on standard setting and we'll then reflect on that and think about are there practicable ways that we can provide assistance. 
So that's the context of today's webinar. Moving on now to the first of our presentations. And I'm delighted that we're joined now by Birgit Kaiser. Birgit is a member of the IA's Professionals and Committee. She is also uh, Vice Chair of the Professionals and Committee of the Actuarial Association of Europe. And in her day job, she's Executive Director of the German Association of Actuaries. In that role, she's responsible for the actuary work of the association, for communications and for professional and international affairs. So over to you, Bert. Thanks a lot, Eva. Welcome, everybody, to our session today. And before I start giving you some insight in how we set standards at the German Association of Actuaries, I would like to start with a few words on our association very briefly, though. Um, the German association was established in 1993 as a, a private association of individual actuaries. We are the professional representation of actuaries with today more than 6,000 um, fully qualified members. There is no obligation to become a member of DAV, but it has been established as sort of standard in Germany that actuaries do become members in our association. Um, we have a special um, branch association, a separate entity within DAV for the German Institute of Pension Actuaries. That is our pension actuaries. Um, they have to take a few more exams and they're organized in, a, um, in their own association with their own code of conduct, etc. And in fact, they are a little older than DAV, but of course, we're very closely together. In fact, um, all members of DAV have... Um, have quite a, a similar background. All our members have a university degree in mathematics or other quantitative studies, and they all undergo training with us to become um, an actuary DAV. This is our credential, and examinations are organized by us as well. So um, we are quite self-organized. All our members have to pass uh, about 10 exams nowadays, and unless, of course, some studies from university are, or exams are recognized. But um, besides these 10 examinations, all members have to prove at least three years of professional experience, and then they can be admitted to the AV. And as members, of course, they have to um, comply with our code of conduct, and they're also required to uh, prove to document appropriate CPD training that is about 20 hours a year, and in fact, 60 hours over a three year period, which is monitored. And in fact, we do have disciplinary rules. And so members have to comply with our code, our standards, we'll come to this in a minute, and our CPD requirements. So in fact, our association is quite homogeneous while our members are working all areas like life, risk management, investment, data science. They work for um, insurance companies as consultants, as auditors. They work in the um, academia as, as university professors. So while we have a quite um, diverse um, group of actuaries within our associations, still most of them are working in Germany. They are they're having passed all the examinations with us. So as an association, I would say we are still quite a homogeneous association. Next slide, please. As DIV, we have no official role. We are not mentioned in law. And though there are um, official functions for actuaries, like the responsible actuaries or the actuarial function holder under Solvency II, um, these functions can be achieved without being a member of DAV. As I said before, you're not obliged to become a member of DAV to practice as a, for instance, responsible actuary. So um, we are a private association and we are in fact recognized as the professional representation, but this has developed over time. This was not, um, so we have no, we're not mentioned in law or anything. Um, we have worked for that over years since 1993. So today we are recognized and to keep up, to maintain this position, we are in constant dialogue with external uh, stakeholders, in particular with the supervisory authority, in Germany it's called Waffin, with the Ministry of Finance, with other professional and industry associations to be in contact, to involve them as good as possible in our work and to make sure that our work is recognized and that in the end, of course, also our standards are being recognized by external stakeholders and of course, by the insurance industry. 
We have also members who are working for the regulator. And we, in fact, we try to make sure that not just the regulator, but also other associations like, for instance, the Auditors Association or the um, Association of the German Insurance Industry, that they too are involved in our committees and working groups. So what we're trying to do is to involve as many stakeholders as early on in our actuarial work so that we can make sure that they are with us on our way to develop standards and that they too will accept these standards as their own. Next slide, please. As DAV, we of course have a code of professional conduct. And while I'm not going to um, go in further detail as regards this code, this code is also important for our topic today because this code is a sort of anchor, of course, not just for the obligation of our members to comply with our CPD requirements, but also it says quite clearly that members have to carry out their activities in compliance with all relevant standards of actuary practice that we develop. And um, of course, we have a disciplinary code, as I said before, to ensure compliance. But um, what we're going to look at now in further detail is, of course, the topic of actuaries, of standards of actuary practice. So next slide, please, Amari. As I said before, DAV is a self-regulating profession. There's no authority behind us, no ministry, not the regulator. So everything we do as an association, we are doing together with our members. That is, our members jointly define the framework under which they would like to practice as actuaries. So whatever we do, we have to agree on the code of conduct, on the um, CPD requirements, on the due process for setting standards with our members. So usually these framework conditions are agreed on are approved during our general assemblies. DAV was founded in 1993, but uh, in fact, we started to set standards a few years later, that was in 1996. The reason was then we had this new function of the um, responsible actuary, which was also introduced in 1993. In fact, it was the very reason why DAV was established in the first place, because there was this new official role of responsible actuaries. And so a professional association was needed to support these function holders to, um, yeah, to develop a framework which will uh, which would support them on their um, daily responsibilities. So DAV was in fact encouraged to be um, established in the first place, but also encouraged by the regulator um, to set standards. And when we started in the first years, um, it was like, um, you have to imagine at that point in time, most of our members were working in life insurance. So it was really a homogeneous association. By now we have members of all practice areas. Anyway, in the first year, standards were approved by the yearly General Assembly. And only after a few years, when more and more members entered DAV and when more and more practice areas entered DAV, and we felt that it was necessary to be more flexible as to the point in time when standards had, were be able to be approved, a due process was developed by the professionalism committee back then. What we in fact did is that we um, introduced this due process. We're going to look at it in a moment. At first for a trial period of five years. So over a time of five years, members were encouraged not only to, um, involve, to get involved um, in specific standards that we were um, suggesting, proposing, but also in the process itself and to, um, to monitor whether this process is working, whether they feel involved, whether they had the feeling that this is something that could be working for, for the time being. And so after five years in 2004, this process was finally approved. And ever since only few amendments have been made. There's always something that needs, can be improved, but basically the process is the same as it was in 2004. Of course, non-compliance is an issue. We do take disciplinary action, but usually, or in most cases, it is due to non-compliance with CPD requirements. Um, we have only few cases of uh, breaches of conduct that refers to um, actuarial standards. But still, of course, we do take disciplinary action whenever it's necessary. 
Members are also encouraged to report if there are any breaches of conduct, but they're not obliged. There's no whistleblowing obligation in our code of conduct. So next slide, please. When we look at our standards, um, we have in fact three different levels according to the due process. I'll start with the bottom. Um, the very first level are edu more or less educational. We call them, let's say, advisory notes. And um, they're characterized by the fact that they have to be taken into account when you're working on a specific subject. But the actuary is completely free to decide whether or not to apply the contents of these advisory notes. So you're not obliged to really um, implement them, but you have to know about them. You have to know that there is an advisory note on the top on the area of work you're in. A little more um, binding are guidelines. Guidelines are also standards in our due process, but here we have a comply or explain rule that is usually you have to apply these guidelines. But of course, if there are good reasons why this is not possible or why um, you have to proceed in a different way. So if you are able to explain why these guidelines are not applicable, then this is fine. And the third and highest level of standards are fundamental principles. You really have to comply with these standards. That's the idea. Um, but in fact, and we'll see that later again, until today, we haven't found one single subject where we really felt here we need a must comply standard. We are quite happy with advisory notes and guidelines. So either papers that only need to be taken into account, you have to know about them, or you have to comply with them unless there's a justifiable individual case where you can um, really demonstrate why these guidelines are not applicable. Three different levels in principle in our due process, but in fact is basically two. Beyond this, we have reports. Um, they are not standards. They are just a means of yeah, transfer information from our committees and working group into the, our membership. So reports are published quite frequently as results of the work um, carried out by our committees and working groups. So they are not binding at all. Members are completely free whether or not they wish to um, look at them, read them, learn from them or apply them. They're completely non-binding, but they do form the basis for our um, standards because in most cases, committees first publish a report and later on the whole report or extracts from these reports are then turned into standards of practice. Okay, next slide, please. So before I take a closer look at our due process, what is important for us for our due process is that we have a broad involvement of all kinds of stakeholders. First of all, um, within DAV, we have today eight specialist committees that is, we have a life insurance committee, a non-life insurance committee, a health committee, a pensions committee, a risk management committee, an investment committee, an accounting committee, and an actuarial data science committee. So we have eight committees and they have their own working groups, task forces, et cetera, all together about 50 working groups, I would say. So all these committees, are involved in our standards setting process. But beyond this, we also try to involve external stakeholders like academia, like professional associations, the auditors, consumer organizations, et cetera, whoever seems to be, um, well, whenever it makes sense to involve these associations in an early stage, then we try to do so. We also have um, yearly talks with these associations. So of course we discuss possible or standards that are going to be involved also in our annual meetings. And then of course, as I said before, um, in most working groups, members from the supervisory authority, the regulator are already involved and they're working with us um, on these standards. So it is quite helpful 
um, if we try to um, yeah to to be um, on a, on the same page from early on, so that we can make sure that the supervisory authorities, in fact, also accept the standards we are setting for our members. And then there's of course the professionalism committee, but um, the committee is responsible for monitoring and overseeing the whole process and to make sure that all uh, stages of the due process are in fact um, taken into account and nothing has been overlooked. Okay, next slide. So what is the process itself? First of all, um, how does the whole process start? In fact, it's the eight committees I've just mentioned, which are responsible for deciding whether or not to issue a standard. Committees in DAV are completely free to decide, yes, this is a topic where we think we feel here a standard is necessary. And if they do so, then in usually a working group is set up, sometimes it already exists, okay, but usually we um, give notes to our members and they can apply for joining such a task force or working group and work on a draft standard. This process can of course be quite time consuming depending on the topic, but however, once this first step is completed and there's a very first draft, then the other seven committees are involved. Over six weeks, they have uh, the time, the possibility to comment on um, the draft, to give their feedback and to jointly make sure that this draft has a certain quality before it is then published to a wider audience that is to all our members, but also to other stakeholders which have perhaps not been involved yet in step number two. And so the next step of um, promulgate of um, yeah, publishing the standard and consultation, I would like to say, is step four. Over three months, members have and others have the time to ask questions. Perhaps a web session takes place to introduce um, the contents of, this, uh, of the standard. And so members have the possibility to be as much involved as they wish to be. There is a possibility for members if they are really dissatisfied with a draft standard um, to forward a veto. And then we have to um, discuss whether there's um, only let's say major points that have to be resolved or whether even the whole draft has to be um, rejected and to be started from scratch again by the committee. But in fact, this is a, a possibility, but so far this has never happened. Usually after three months of consultation, we are always able to really find a compromise and a uh, yes, a joint standard that is acceptable to all. And so in the usual, the normal case is that after step four, the final draft is produced, sent to the board, and after approval of the board, the standard is published and is then enters then into force. So our due process has really two, I think I would say important steps, that's steps two, the internal um, quality control of all our committees and important stakeholders and then step number four where we open the consultation phase to a wider audience to all our members and to other stakeholders that we wish to involve or which like to be involved by asking to be able to comment on our standards next slide please there are special provisions of course in case in particular for the case that things have to be quite uh, have to be speed up because sometimes, of course, this whole protects, um, can, process can take quite some time, you know, six weeks and then plus another three months for consultation. So there is a possibility to omit uh, steps three and four if uh, there's a need for hurrying, but then the standard will be withdrawn after 18 months unless the regular due process has been completed during the same time frame. But this is just an emergency um, provision, if you wish, um, so that if really necessary, a standard can be issued quite quickly. And every four years, each standard has to be um, looked at again by the responsible committee. And so this is another means to really ensure that standards are up to date and that the quality of the standard is maintained. Our due process also contains various options for implementing IAA 
model standards, that is ISAPs. First of all, we have made that decision that only standards in German are issued. There are no English standards, so the minimum we have to do is to translate a model standard. But of course, we can also adapt it to our own um, regulatory requirements, adapt an existing standard or practice, or even develop something completely new and take into account the content of the ISAP. And in any case, first our due process has to be followed before then a standard is really published and enters into a force and is then binding for our members. Next slide. So as I said before, there, is, there are in fact no fundamental principles. This has been introduced when the due process was developed um, in the late 90s, but until today, no need was seen to really issue such a standard. We have, however, 17 guidelines today. As you see, most are in the area of life insurance, where the role of the responsible actuary is uh, particularly prominent. And then next slide, please. We have another 44 advisory notes. This is the a huge, I mean, the, the largest part of our standards. And in contrast to this, we have about 190 reports so far from our committees and working groups. And thus you can see that we are not trying to issue as many standards as possible, but rather try to be a little well, careful first to issue reports and really say, this is the, um, the result of our work before we then usually start um, introducing advisory notes and only if it's really necessary and we feel that there's a topic that really requires a comply and explain standard, then we issue guidelines. And uh, for instance, mortality tables are usually issued in the format of guidelines. So next slide, please. So altogether, I think the most important part for us is we are self-regulating. Everything we do, we have to define ourselves together with our members. It's members working for um, the whole membership. And we always need to ensure that our work is accepted by the outside world, also by our members, of course. But um, as we have no official rule, role, as there's no authority behind us, uh, we try to make sure with our processes that external stakeholders are involved as much as possible. So to make sure that they are really accepting our standards. Altogether, this works quite well. And we're quite satisfied with the um, due process of setting standards we have. Um, so the process itself, as I said before, there's little need for amendments. But what we do think about is, again, how do we really enforce standards in case members are not willing to comply? And how can we um, work on our disciplinary scheme to further improve the possibilities we have to really make sure that members are compliant with our standards? And I think this is it for the time being from my part. And I would like to hand over to Lisa. Good morning. Sorry, um, sorry, sorry, you're okay. in there. <laughs> sorry, Lisa, I just couldn't quite get to my, my own mute. I couldn't see where it was. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, yeah, okay, thanks a million, Berger, for that. Um, we do have a few questions in and we'll get to those after Lisa's presentation. Just to remind everybody, if you have a question or just a comment, you can type it in at the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. You can add your name or you can contribute anonymously, whichever you prefer, and we'll come back to those later on. So to introduce Lisa, Lisa is a member of the IAA's Executive Committee and and its Actuarial Standards Committee, and she is a past president of the Caribbean Actuarial Association. She is a principal and consulting actuary with Eckler Limited and based in its Barbados office. She, her work, her day-to-day -day work is focused on the employee benefits practice. She provides clients in the Caribbean with advice regarding regulation, technical issues, and professional standards. So over to you, Lisa, thanks. Thanks very much, Yvonne. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night to everyone. Thanks for joining us today, no matter what part of the world you're presently in. So I'm going to start today by giving you a, a bit of information about um, the Caribbean Actuarial Association, or CAA, as I will be calling it. The CAA is a regional association um, for the Caribbean. 
Um, it's the association to which most actuaries who practice in the Caribbean belong. I would say it's, it's a bit different in that um, the term Caribbean is not defined within the articles of the CAA, but to give you an idea of the, the breadth of it, um, you could say that Caribbean could be looked at um, in terms of CARICOM or the Caribbean community, which is a, a 15 state regional grouping that works together in terms of economic issues as well as trade issues. So our members have many different classes. We've got fully qualified actuaries, associates and students, many of which um, live and work in the English speaking and Dutch speaking Caribbean, as well as the wider diaspora, meaning persons who are of Caribbean her heritage living in different countries of the world. We're a relatively young association and I think we're quite small compared to the DAV with approximately 300 members. The qualification route for actuaries in the Caribbean pretty much tends to be um, many persons will either study at our regional university, which offers an actuarial science degree, or they will take university courses internationally. Um, we're not an examining association, so our members qualify through other as, uh, associations, such as the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries, the Society of Actuaries, and the Casualty Actuarial Society. Uh, we also have a lot of members from the Canadian Institute of Actuaries that practice widely within the Caribbean. So you can see we've got quite a mix of different actuarial associations in there who all have um, different practice standards. Our members work in a wide range of areas within the financial services primarily life insurance, um, pensions, as well as property and casualty. And we also do have social security actuaries as well. Despite being a relatively young association, we do have quite a robust governance framework with a code of conduct, disciplinary process, continuing professional development requirements, as well as standards of practice. I would say that um, for a developing association as ours, being multi-jurisdictional in nature does pose some challenges in terms of standard settings and, com and compliance. And I'll discuss a couple of these today. Next slide. So the chart shows the, the distribution of members by their country of residence. And I'll indicate that many members, um, though residing in one particular country, may practice in several jurisdictions. It's really important to note that for each of the Caribbean countries shown above, there's a different legislative framework for financial institutions, as well as a different regulator. And there tends to be very little harmonization in terms of legislation throughout the region, despite the fact that there are you know, several large regional financial institutions which operate and report in, in several countries. Um, the only exception would be with respect to a subgrouping within CARICOM, known as the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, um, it's not reflected above. Um, those are those would be country specific persons who are there, and um, they have harmonization in terms of of most of their of their legislation. Next slide. So our code of conduct contains many of the key principles for for similar documents for larger actuarial associations, and incorporates the main concepts required by the IAA for full member associations, in terms of their code of conduct in terms of the actuary performing work with competence and care, acting in the public interest. Um, our members are subject to the CAA's disciplinary process and um, they must take into account any relevant standards of practice which have been promulgated by the CAA. The CAA is self-regulating um, and we do have a process to develop and promulgate standards of practice the CAA made the decision to be self-regulating um, for, for many reasons. And one, um, as actuaries, we think we're better to, to govern ourselves. We would prefer to be proactive in terms of, of governing ourselves and setting down rules respect to uh, the, the conduct of actuarial work rather than have this imposed on us. But within the Caribbean, generally, legislation is slow to change. So if we're to keep up with international best practice, it would be in our best interest as professionals to set out standards of practice and to be self-regulating in this way. We also wish to have some level of consistency of approach throughout the Caribbean with respect to, to standards of practice. 
And there are large financial institutions which operate regionally. And having regional standards of practice does ensure that there's consistency within their reporting. Next slide. So for an association of our size, and, and we would say our stage of development, it was pretty ambitious for us when we started off on this process back in 2004 to set standards of practice. Um, back then we were quite, quite a lot smaller than we are today. Um, we, we undertook this process with several main objectives. Uh, it set out a set of comprehensive standards for, for the Caribbean in terms of work carried out in the Caribbean. Uh, we wanted to be recognized by the regulators and important stakeholders as the actual standard setter. Consistency with international best practice was also a key tenant for us. When we established this comprehensive uh, set of actuarial standards, which we wanted to apply to work in the region, we were really cognizant of the fact that many of the actuaries who practice in the Caribbean have different qualifications or qualify under, under different routes. And we wanted to have some level of consistency in terms of the output of actuaries who are working in the Caribbean in that their reports could be interpreted in similar ways and viewed by the public and regulators um, a bit more easily. We wish to narrow the range of acceptable results. We also thought that through having a, a set of standards, we would enhance the reputation of the, the profession within the Caribbean and we'd also provide some guidance in terms of appropriate professional practice within the Caribbean. And this is particularly important for us because we wished that actuarial work which takes place in the Caribbean would reflect local, local conditions. Another key tenant for us was convergence with IAA standards. We saw that the work being done by the IAA was, was invaluable in terms of ensuring that any standards that we, we published or promulgated would be in accordance with international best practice. So there, there are two, two key things that I wanted to discuss in terms of the CA's journey with respect to standards. Firstly, internally, the Caribbean Natural Association set up something called a steering committee. It's an internal committee that meets several times a year and consists of the chairs of all of the CAA's technical committees, as well as members of the CAA's board. We discuss issues facing the profession within the region, how standards can help. And we also have, it's also an informal forum with respect to feedback on, on draft standards, which are being considered right now or out for exposure. Secondly, we try really, really hard to engage with our key stakeholders within the region. We have a number of key stakeholders or strategic partners as we would call them. Um, those primarily being the Association of um, Insurance Regulators, the Association of Pension Supervisors, the Insurance Association of the Caribbean, and also I should have included the Institute of Chartered Accountants of the Caribbean. So how have we worked with these strategic partners in terms of the furtherance of development of standards within the Caribbean? Well, what we've done is we've set up something called the Advisory Council, which is a grouping which meets and provides regular feedback from regulators, the financial services industry, in terms of the CAA strategic direction on the development of standards. The CAA would generally report to this grouping in terms of the areas of future standards development, as well as other technical projects that are being carried out. For example, experience studies, and we get their input in terms of the priorities that we are currently setting for ourselves. Next slide. So one of the things that we did when we started to, to accelerate our production of standards is we set about to, to determine what we wanted to do as an association and how we can leverage some of the other standard setting um, information that was out there in particularly the international standards of actuarial practice. So what we did is we came up with our actuarial standards architecture, which you see on the screen right now. So what we have done is we've, within the areas that are green, we've looked towards the IAA's ISAPs, International Standards of Actuarial Practice, to, to provide us with model standards which we would then review and make a decision as to whether or not we were going to adopt. The ISAPs by, by nature, one, conform to international best practice, and two, 
also as their model standards are easily reviewed and adapted or adopted um, by, by smaller developing actuarial associations such as ours. And secondly, they also take on a lot of those global issues, which for an association like ours, given our current size and our limitations in terms of resources, really helps us a lot in terms of, of having a robust set of standards. We do have practice standards in the, in the areas that you've seen there. We have life insurance standard, a non-life insurance standard, pension standard, as well as a social insurance standard. Within the base or foundation of, of what we are trying to accomplish in terms of narrowing the range of results and, and improving the quality of actuarial work within the Caribbean, we also look towards those areas that we call or would consider cross-practice um, cross practice areas in which we do recognize some of the factors to be considered by actuaries practicing within the Caribbean are uniquely Caribbean in nature, such as the economic, in, the economic environment. Uh, what we have done as an organization is that we've been carrying out um, experience studies, for example, in mortality, and we also have been carrying out projects in terms of setting of discount rates to try to, to find ways in terms of assisting our members in determining what are reasonable assumptions. Next slide. So this is our current slate of actuarial standards within the Caribbean. Our, our standards are principles based, and this is important for us. Um, the legislative framework governing actuarial work within the Caribbean is, is not very developed. Depending on the jurisdiction in which you are reporting in, it, it's just extremely variable in terms of the legislative framework. Within some countries, there is a much stronger or robust framework, whereas in other countries, to be honest, the legislation for some, some is like less than four pages long. So what we've done is we've set up principle-based standards which means that it would be easier when you're doing work across different jurisdictions in order to comply, rather than being too prescriptive, given the variation with respect to the legislative framework. Um, we've identified areas that the actuary should consider in their work, um, the professional judgment that we think should be applied by actuaries in carrying out their work. The, the standards are consistent in terms of their style of drafting, uh, what we did when um, ISAP 1 came out is we did a main, major revision with respect to our standards. Firstly, um, we, we, in terms of nomenclature, we reviewed ISAP 1, we agreed that yes, definitely it would be a fantastic way to improve the quality of work within the region. So we did adopt it and we named it a APS 0, so that's our base standard upon which it is assumed that all, all actuaries practicing within the Caribbean um, would comply with APS zero. And we reviewed all of the other standards so that they became um, building blocks on top of APS zero. So they are consistent in that they assume that APS zero is, is in operation within the um, adoption or the use of those particular standards. So there are a number of approaches that the CAA took within developing um, our current suite of standards. Uh, the first approach that we took, um, because those standards would have predated the, the ISAP project carried out by the IAA, the first approach that we would have taken was that we would have looked around different um, actuarial associations, uh, practice standards, um, determined what we thought was a suitable standard for us to to adopt, to adapt, and we would have used that particular standard almost like a model standard. A technical committee would have been appointed, which would have reviewed the standard um, for use within the Caribbean, and would have made the necessary modifications to that particular standard. So that would have been the case with respect to APS 1 and APS 2. When the IAA's project in terms of global convergence on actuarial standards was launched, we started examining um, one by one the standards, the model standards that were put out by the Actuarial Standards Committee. And so we adopted APS 0, which is ISAP 1, as well as APS 3, which is ISAP 2. Um, our other two standards took a pretty similar approach to, to APS 1 and APS 2 in that we looked for suitable actuarial standards 
um, within within different um, actual associations and, and made the necessary changes for them for the Caribbean environment and Caribbean context. Generally, we would say that our standards um, tend to be technical standards, but they do take into account um, governance as well as communication standards, um, best practices and principles. Next slide. As indicated before, um, the, the Caribbean is, is pretty unique. Um, it, we believe in terms of actual associations, it is multi-jurisdictional in nature, and it's got a very varied um, level of development with respect to legislative framework for actual practice. So due to the fact that different countries are just in this different stages of development of their financial services industry, um, and also definitely with respect to their regulatory frameworks as well as regulatory environments. You know, there are two different ways in which the standards are recognized or used within the Caribbean. Uh, firstly, we would have um, formal recognition under which an actuary practicing within that particular country or within that specific um, specialization must be a member of the Caribbean Actuarial Association. And because of our code of conduct, that then means that they must carry out their work in accordance with our standards of practice. Um, the second way in which there's, there's formal recognition through legislation is, is through the recognition of the actual standards of practice themselves. So the actuary doesn't need to be a member of the Caribbean Actuarial Association meaning that they're not subject to our code of conduct or disciplinary process. However, it is expected um, through the legislation that any work carried out would be done in accordance with the association's actual standards of practice. The, the second modus operandi is through informal uh, recognition, which is actually used quite commonly within the Caribbean, where the, the regulator basically expresses to the, the industry at large that actual work carried out within that jurisdiction must be carried out in accordance with the standards of the, the CAA. Next slide, please. So due process, we do have a, a due process for the adoption of new standards of, of actual practice. Um, the, the due process is, is pretty short, just about 12 points on a page. Uh, the reason why we think um, it's important to put it out there in the public domain is firstly, we believe it's important to have transparency within the setting of actuarial standards of practice that does provide the public and regulators also with confidence in terms of understanding what the process is for promulgating new standards of practice. We believe that it's, it's appropriate and proportionate to the, to, the, to the scope of the standards of practice which we have set within the Caribbean. Um, and it, it is a short process, but we think it is pretty, pretty rigorous. Um, the entire process will take in general between three to six months. Um, we would have, a, we would first establish the need for the particular standard. Um, it's usually the, at a board level that the board would indicate that they are in agreement with this particular need. But the ask in terms of the standard can come from one of our strategic partners, such as the, any of the regulators that that we, we discuss issues with or the industry through the advisory council or the, the technical committees through their membership could indicate that because of changes in best practice internationally or changes within uh, accounting or financial standards that there is a need to make a change with respect to our standards of practice or even a need to have a new standard of practice. So after the, the need has been identified, the standards are drafted through a, a technical committee, which is appointed by, by our board, and they go through an initial approval process before being circulated to members as an exposure draft. We do give quite a long period for the comments um, of the exposure drafts that can range between one to three months, depending on the size and scope of the standard and its potential impact. After the comment period closes, uh, the comments are reviewed by the technical committee, um, discussed as well with the steering committee, and a decision is made as to whether or not the draft standard needs to be re-exposed, um, depending on the materiality of the comments that are received. If there are material changes, there will be a further exposure period, 
and, and through this exposure period, uh, additional comments are, 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 are got and vetted. And um, if there are no other material changes, then the standards are ratified by members at the next annual general meeting. We do because of the, the size constraints of the association, I would say we don't necessarily get a whole lot of feedback um, with respect to standards. Of course, um, we have had instances in the past where we've gotten quite a lot of feedback and had to make material changes to propose standards of practice because it may have been deemed that the, the scope of the standard may have been probably a, a bit too large or wide um, given the development of practice within a particular area. But um, in general, um, you know, feedback can be a bit on the light side at times. Um, next slide. So in terms of, of final remarks, we do believe that standards are really important to building on um, public trust and work. Uh, for a, a developing association like ours and in a developing region like ours, it's really important to have that public trust in terms of the quality of, of actuarial work which is done. We think it's really important for uh, us to have standards of practices within the Caribbean given the different qualification route of actuaries who practice in the Caribbean to, to narrow the range of results, um, to ensure that, that the work carried out within the Caribbean actually reflects local conditions as well as international best practice. Uh, for developing associations such as ours, having a, a set of standards is really honestly a, a significant resource commitment. Um, the development of standards, all of that work takes place through volunteers. So it is a significant um, resource commitment in terms of, of the time and effort that our volunteers put in, but they're all very keen and enthusiastic, which has really been very helpful in terms of furthering um, the, the setting of standards within the region. And I would honestly say that the ISAPs developed by the IAA have been an invaluable resource in terms of furthering the development of standards within the Caribbean. And it's definitely something that we look towards um, in terms of building out our set of standards. And I think for me, the final word I would say is that, you know, if it's a case that the IAA does make a decision to develop the specimen natural standards, I think developing association like ours would be very appreciative of that because it will cut down on the resource commitment in terms of building out our standards. And it is something that we definitely will use. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Lisa. I think good messages there at the end. Yes, it's, it's, it's resource hungry developing standards, but there are aids out there and there are supports available and hopefully the IA can, can also continue to build, build on that and help um, emerging associations. Um, so just a reminder that we do have the virtual workshop coming up at the end of October, 25th of October. So if your association would like to participate that, if you're starting off on the standard setting journey or early in that journey and would like to, to explore, you know, challenges and how, how people face them um, with experienced standard setters, do drop them out an email in the next few days and we'll try and uh, organize that. And um, if particularly if your association is going to be represented at that workshop, if you haven't listened to the previous webinar, I would encourage you to do so. There's a link there to the recording and to the presentation slides. Okay, we'll move on now to Q&A. We have about five or six questions here, so, and we have only about six minutes, I think. So um, we'll, we'll try and get through the questions quite quickly. Um, Birgit, there's a question here about um, how DAV standards deal with cross-border issues, and also what's the relationship with AAE standards and with ISAPs? Mm -hmm. Well, I start with the second question because that's easier okay. to, to reply to. <laughs> and in fact, we closely monitor what IAA and AAE are doing as regards standards. And um, so our committees and working groups comment on the preliminary drafts. And um, then we already try to figure out how this would best fit in. So that means, do we already have standards which cover the subject? Then we're fine anyway. And this is sometimes simply the case. And the second approach would be to adapt an existing standard and to um, incorporate the contents um, that go beyond that. And only the third possibility would be to really develop a new standard. We did that with ISAP 1, 
because we had not anything in place that would be um, close enough to um, ISAP 1 which, so that we could adapt an existing standard. But this is the only case I recall where we really developed something new and a new standard covering ISAP 1. As regards cross-border practice, um, I mean, most really the huge majority of German actuaries are working for the German insurance industry. That is cross-border practice, really not a major topic for us. There are few actuaries which practice abroad. They do exist, of course, and uh, many in Europe. Um, but so far, this has really not been on the very high on the priority list, to be honest. Um, so members are encouraged, of course, to be, first of all, to become a member of the foreign association. This is our first um, point. We're trying to convince our members to become a member of the local actuarial mm -hmm. association. And, um, and then, of course, to inform them, then you have to comply with local standards in first place. And if you see a conflict with German standards, please report. Just let us know. Um, but for us, it's more important really to... Um, to, yeah, to encourage people to enter the local association because okay, I that makes many a lot of, of our sense. members just don't do this. They don't think about it. No. And sometimes they even, they're not sure whether they're able to. And so, so this is rather a point of activity for us than cross-border um, issues with standards. Okay, that's interesting. There was another question on the standards in Germany. Why so few on non-life? Um, the reason is, first of all, when we started, we were really an, in, an association of life insurance industry, and this has changed over time. And in non-life, there has never been a um, official role for actuaries, unlike the responsible actuaries, only for um, life, health, and pensions. Um, not for non-life, there is no role. So in the first years or the first 10, 15 years, there was little external pressure for standards. So what uh, we did was issue a lot of reports, a lot of educational material on non-life, but there was not such a need to issue standards. Only since we have the actuarial function holder, which is also relevant for non-life, the committee started to think more in terms of standards. Okay. And Lisa, a couple for you. Um, one person was wondering, are your standards written both in Dutch and English? And there was another question about what is on the drawing board for your standards? Yeah, at present, our standards are only in English. Um, our Dutch members are all fluent English speakers at present as well. So we're, we're kind of fortunate there, but I can imagine as, as membership may grow within the Dutch Caribbean, that we may have a question on that particular issue, but but thankfully all our, our Dutch members are, are fluent speakers of English and they, they regularly come to all of our conferences and we know all of them. So they they serve have served on our board. So they're well integrated within the association. In terms of the drawing board for standards, I think right now what we are considering is the impact of IFR 17 on our, on our standards of practice. So right now we're having a, a look at our life standard and our non-life standard in order to make changes there to ensure that they are um, compliant with IFRS 17 and to provide any other additional guidance to our members within in terms of the application of IFRS 17. And I think for that, we will very much look towards um, ISAP 4, mm -hmm. which was the model standard developed by the IAA um, for IFRS 17. I think another useful resource developed by the IAA on IFRS 17 was the in the International Actuary Note on um, on, the, on that IFRS, I'm sure. A lot of actors around the world drive and benefit from that. Um, there's another question, and I think it could be put to both of you. Uh, we'll start maybe with Birgit. If there's a violation of standard, what's the potential disciplinary action against the members, and how do you ensure that it is actually executable? That's, in fact, one of the huge, uh, the biggest challenges for our association. And we have a quite uh, slim disciplinary uh, process. So if um, breaches of conduct are reported or if we find out for ourselves, then the disciplinary um, proce procedures are, um, are opened, are introduced. And um, in fact, we have only three levels of um, sanctions within our association. The first one is just to... Yeah, to, um, to teach members how to behave properly, so to speak. A second one would be a reprimand. And the third one is already the exclusion from our association. And so um, we try to be in contact with our members to discuss things. And often enough, um, we can settle things. 
but um, if they continue to, um, to, to be not compliant with our standards or our code of conduct, then in the end, we have to um, exclude them from our association. And we've done that so already. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uncomfortable situation to be in, but standards yeah. have no credibility if you're not seen to enforce them. Exactly. Lisa, do you want to comment on that question? I would, I would say that one is a bit more difficult for us. Um, just because it's been a bit harder for us, I think, to be able to track compliance, okay. given the, yeah. the multi-jurisdictional nature of the association. So, I mean, at times we've done polls to try to get an idea of it, but I would honestly say for us um, that that would be a bit more difficult, especially in the framework whereby the legislation does not necessarily require you to be a member of the CAA yeah. or doesn't Same necessarily us. require you to follow the standards. So it's a little bit more difficult for us. And I mean, it really has been something whereby we've been, you know, having discussions with regulators about the formal recognition of the standards or of the CAA. But it is, it is, it is a much more difficult situation for us than it would be, I think, um, in, in, for, for other countries where, you know, there's a requirement to belong to a particular body or follow a particular set of standards. Okay. Well, that's the same in Germany. You don't have yeah. to be a member of our association. And so, of course, even if we do exclude a member, then they can continue to practice as actuaries, of course, if the regulator doesn't interfere. Yeah, I'm with the Society of Actuaries in Ireland, and it's similar. There are very few roles for which you actually have to be a member mm. of the yeah. association. So you do have to continue to engage with members and make sure that you're providing a strong member proposition and, yeah. and you know, work to ensure that um, members do appreciate the value of standards and row in behind them. There's one more question on how many participants there are, which Nancy has answered in the chat that there are 50 participants today. We are actually out of time. So I want to say a huge thank you to all the participants. Thank you to the attendees. Well, thank you for coming along today, for participating, listening, putting your questions and comments. And if you have any feedback afterwards or, or other questions or comments, by all means, um, maybe email them to, to Mala. That would be very helpful. A huge thank you to Lisa and Birgit for two excellent presentations today I think they were really informative um, and thank you to Amali and Nancy who are here in the background they've helped us prepare they've made sure everything ran smoothly today thanks also to other people on the professionals and committee who've helped us to develop the ideas for this series of virtual events and content and so forth I look forward to meeting some of the attendees here today at our virtual workshops and after that, that workshop then we will take stock and think about what next how else can, can we help us associations and serve the membership of the of the IAA. So um, at that I'll, I'll wrap up for today and hope you all have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks.